Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's occasional lecture. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Rosemary Lang and I'm the Clerk of the Senate. And it's a great pleasure to kick off the 2016 series of Senate occasional lectures. This is, uh, I was trying to work out whether it was our 27th or 28th year, but uh, I hadn't quite done the sums. But these lectures have been going for quite a long time and um, we rely on you, our faithful audience, to come along and support our lecturers. And I know you'll have no trouble today in um, finding joy in coming here to Parliament House on a lovely Friday. Could I, for uh, practical purposes, ask you to turn any mobile devices to silent? And um, that, that will be terrific. Thank you very much. But first of all, obviously, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Graham has been with us before, and I think it was about 10 years ago he gave us a fabulous lecture on government advertising. But today we've asked him to speak about a, a new book that came out last year that, that he wrote uh, about the rituals of e elections. Uh, Professor Graham Orr is Professor of Law at the University of Queensland, and he has a particular interest in, I suppose, the law of politics, the regulation of political parties, of democracy, electoral law, uh, but also the language and symbols and its relationship with the law. And um, it, it's a very interesting field, as I'm sure you'll appreciate by the end of this lecture. Uh, he particularly researches and commentates on how political parties and electoral democracy are shaped by law. And of course, law is what we do in this building. Uh, Graham is a well-published um, well author of a number of authoritative texts, including The Law of Politics, Elections, Parties and Money in Australia, uh, which came out a few years ago. And, and you can see from my copy how much I rely on using it in, in my work. But uh, his most recent book, Ritual and Rhythm in Electoral Systems, a comparative legal account, is, uh, I guess, the basis of, of his lecture today. So I'd like you to please welcome Professor Graham Orr. Thank you. I have a few PowerPoint slides, as you can see, not because I have powerful points to make, but I do have some nice pickies to offer you as illustrations. Uh, before diving in, thank you very much, Rosemary, for the introduction um, as Clerk of the Senate, but also to your staff for the invitation and hospitality, and for continuing to support this great uh, uh, series and the papers on Parliament that it produces. As you say, it's customary to acknowledge the normal people, the custodians of, I think, of this region. But in truth, I should acknowledge, I guess, all the peoples I passed over flying here from Brisbane. Um, I was just thinking, we, we argue a lot about federation amongst the eight different jurisdictions in Australia. In modern Australia, yet we know very little about the cooperative forms of government that were practiced for, by hundreds of interlocked peoples who came before white Australia. As Rosemary said, my area is a, is a niche, which we call the law of politics. It, it's a fairly new subfield, and it hoovers up not just the rules about elections, but the rules governing parliaments, political parties and money in politics. It mixes constitutional, administrative issues and political science concerns in roughly equal parts. I found it fun working in this relatively new subdiscipline. But 10 years ago, I, I paused from the more boring labor of wading through statute law and case law. And I wrote an essay in the Federal Law Review, which is published at Australian National University here in Canberra. And the essay was called Ritual and Aesthetics in Electoral Law. So it was a, f a first attempt at a sociological understanding of elections as events, events we experience. And 10 years later, I turned the little tunes in that paper into this book called Ritual and Rhythm in Electoral Law. And a few wags have asked me if I'm Catholic. Um, <laughs> it's not about the rhythm method, no. And hopefully this talk will distill some of the flavour of that uh, academic tome and convince you of the importance of thinking about uh, elections, but more broadly, public institutions and practices in terms of how we experience them, 
but also what meaning might be embedded in the forms and patterns of these institutions, laws and practices. On, on the way to this forum, I was uh, reflecting on the charms of Canberra. As you know, we non-Canberrans are meant either to embrace with awe Canberra's great public buildings and national symbols, or we're meant to malign its sprawling suburbs and alleged lack of dynamism. But what always strikes me most about coming to Canberra is what a gracious and spacious city you have here. It's obviously very Australian in its natural environment, and yet in one key respect it seems to me uh, much more European than most English-speaking uh, cities. And I mean aesthetically. This is certainly the only city in Australia that does not bombard you with billboards, neon lights, constant advertising. Now, commerce is here, but it isn't the dominant motive. So Canberra has an aesthetic that both reflects and reinforces the culture and the governmental and community values of the place. So at one level, appearances matter. Okay. Thinking about ritual occurs at the cusp of political culture and law. The institutions and the rules of democracy at once open up and can also constrain the very space in which great public events like elections occur. Culture or law, chicken or egg, at one level it hardly matters. They obviously feed back on each other in a symbiotic process. So if we take uh, Japan there on the top left of the screen. Japan has a parliamentary and a party system. In that sense, it's like Australia. It has a collective rather than individualised politics. But unlike in Australia, in Japan, campaign expenditure is limited by law. And also Japanese public funding of election campaigns doesn't just pay for posters on billboards, billboards that are highly regulated by local governments. It also provides, or at least provided, Quote, one campaign car or campaign boat per candidate. <laughs> and you might have read stories of Gough Whitlam, I think, going down the, the rivers in Sydney campaigning in the 50s. But um, that rule, one campaign car or boat, seems odd to us, but in a way it perpetuates the traditional street level campaigning, complete with the white gloves that's famous in Japan. And in such street level campaigning, in a very differential culture, we see the classic inversion of election time, when our rulers come down from on high to us to beg for votes. Somewhat in contrast, if we move to the right of the screen, the United States notoriously has a, a more look at me culture. The US Constitution requires a directly elected executive president. Go Barbie, go Hillary, go girl, as this doll I found in Los Angeles in the late 2000s proclaims. The US's First Amendment, the right to free speech, forbids limits on political expenditure, so private political money is king in the states. And its statute law, for more than a century, has required primary elections, where every elector can help pre-select the individual candidates for the general election. The whole structure, from constitution through to party primary laws in America, is designed to weaken US-based parties and conversely, to empower charismatic, well-heeled individual candidates. And then just for some leavening, at the bottom of the screen, let's contrast our neighbours across the ditch in Aotearoa. New Zealand has a modest campaign culture, more like the British even than ours. There's an accent on text-based campaigns through billboards and pamphlets. But like here, there's a healthy dose of cynicism and humour and even disrespect as this defaced billboard, I think John Key's been replaced by Shrek, and a very bad pun, is common with, with, with Australian culture. Now, New Zealand law pays a big role in setting short parliamentary terms, campaign periods, and then heavily regulating them, quite unlike, say, the United States. New Zealand law also has limits, limits on paid TV ads at election time in favour of a rationed system of free airtime for parties. Finally, New Zealand toned things down by banning electioneering completely on polling day. Okay, 
This uh, rather fussy diagram is uh, something I talk through every year with my Law of Politics students. Government officials and lawyers, we, we prefer to think in terms of analytical classifications or we prefer to think in terms of normative goals and rather than to think about messy things like culture. Now this diagram attempts to show the various answers to the important question, why? Why do we have elections? And so the diagram pictures the different concepts through which we might understand electoral democracy and the goals that might drive regulation, the way we run elections. The top two quarters of the diagram are far and away the most dominant strains in official and in academic thinking. So officially, we either think about elections as, top left, instruments for better government, or we think about them in terms of uh, lofty goals, triumphs of liberal democracy. And yet, when you talk to the media, or you talk at parties, the bottom half of the diagram rears its head. The elections as a charade view, you'll know, is a very cynical outsider's but very common counterpoint to the idea of elections as integrity mechanisms for good government. I'm not going to talk about that today. My theme today revolves around this uh, bottom left quadrant of the diagram. It's the idea of elections as a secular ritual. Now, I'll define ritual as any patterned human activity embodying social value or meaning. So patterned human activity that embodies some social value. The patterned recurrent and hence rhythmical nature of rituals does not mean that just any old habit is a public ritual. I scratch my flaky scalp whenever I'm bored or agitated. It's just a habit, has no meaning. Some rituals are obviously private. Take the example of someone who might take her coffee at the same place at the same time every day. To an outsider, it might look like a routine or that she's in a, even a rut. But if the cafe is where she met her late partner, we'd recognise that she is living out something meaningful, embodied in a personal ritual. Now, it's my contention that when we think about electoral democracy and constitutional laws and institutions more generally, we should think about public or shared rituals. In saying we should think about these things, I don't mean we should worship ritual uncritically. Rituals can be rich and positive, or they can be ritualistic in the negative sense, like a North Korean harvest festival or election. So my book was born of dissatisfaction with the language and concepts typically used to describe and evaluate the framework through which we run elections. That language and those concepts draw heavily, as I said, on ideas of elections as instruments, regulating competitions for power, whose integrity must be managed, or they draw on theories of elections as great exercises destined to achieve liberal values like political freedom, political equality, and optimistically, popular deliberation. In the instrumental and integrity analysis, the thinking is often very dry, numerical, quantitative. In the vision of elections as great liberal moments, the analysis is often very normative and lofty. Now don't get me wrong, each of those two key perspectives is vital. Together they help encapsulate the ideal of free and fair elections. But we, and here I'm talking about academics, bureaucrats, politicians, judges, the people who study and shape the electoral process, we too rarely address elections as from the experiential dimension. Of course there are exceptions. There have been historians who have focused on early elections as rowdy communal events. And a few sociologists consider the colour and meaning of broader political practices like public assemblies and demonstrations. But the study of electoral systems has tended to lack this dimension. It's been fixated on the outcome of electoral democracy rather than the journey. It's concerned itself with, to use the jargon, purposive goals rather than the inbuilt or latent function of elections. So we purport to know a lot about elections through abstractions, through book learning, or through quantitative studies of voter behaviour and electoral statistics, but not necessarily with enough concern for knowing about the electoral experience. Now, cocooned in these ideas of elections as great instrumental 
aspects of the working of government or full of lofty liberal virtues, we tend to forget that elections are nothing if not great social events. These are events whose very configuration shapes our experience of electoral democracy. Elections, in short, are giant rituals. They are recurring political masquerades and festivals. And then each individual election is made up of lots of what I call everyday rituals. Campaign activities, balloting, voting, the declaration of the polls, inauguration of members. They are events whose very rhythms, patterns and activities are either set by or contoured by law and by administrative institutions like the electoral commissions. Western ana analysts have tended to either ignore or deride ritual understandings of politics. Uh, a US professor once said that, quote, anthropological studies are too often dismissed as bearing only on the political organisation of so-called primitive societies living in small scale groups. So we find it very easy to stare at other cultures or to look back on our own past, the past being a quaint foreign country, of course. So take the painting on the left. It's by British artist uh, William Hogarth, car caricaturing a typically feisty Oxfordshire election in 18th century England. The painting is called The Chairing of the Member. Polling before the late Victorian era, so before the late uh, 19th century, was a multi-day festival. It was colourful, it was full of reciprocity, full of bribes and booze, with voting by voice rather than by secret ballot. Let's leap forward to contemporary times. To the right-hand image, a picture stolen from the front of a book by uh, Colin Hughes and Brian Costa. I think it's copyright to the AEC, if there's anyone from the AEC here. Um, thanks. <laughs> It's from a small northern New South Wales town early on election morning in the 2000s. That's a family, including the adults, the casual AEC workers, I believe, heading down the road to set up the one day every three or four years ritual of secret balloting, carrying those recyclable cardboard booths as shelters to cater for the pencil on paper ballot that is mandated. Pencils are still mandated in Australian Electoral Act. And unlike the US or the UK, which vote on Tuesdays or Thursdays, work days, it's a Saturday morning. Not a busy work day, but traditionally a family day. The pre-reform election is bursting, overflowing with public ritual. But various democratic reforms in the interim, especially secret balloting and clamping down on crude corruption in the form of bribery and treating of voters, have led to the ritual becoming much quieter much more embedded as part of what I call the ritual of the everyday. Now on its face, there's a linguistic contradiction here. A secular society that comes together as a polity once every three or four years, that's hardly an everyday event, literally. But an election, or oh, election obviously, is a national moment. It's a consti constitutive one, but it's also a theatrical one. Our triennial elections established the great rhythm the seasons of parliamentary politics. But at another level of legal rules and administrative practice, elections are also a quotidian, an everyday experience, and none more so in that trip down to the local school or the local community hall as we're summonsed, indeed compelled to turn out by law in Australia, summons back to that site of compulsory education, of our coming of age, of our rounding out, hopefully, as citizens. Okay, let's now focus on polling day, because that's the culmination of the electoral ritual. Polling is at once a private, but also a communal, and also the most public of citizen actions. First of all, voting is done in private, at least since the coming of the secret ballot. Here is an image, thank you again AEC, of Tiwi Islanders voting behind those cardboard screens. The closet of prayer line comes at the end of Les A. Murray's poem, My Ancestress and the Secret Ballot. The everydayness of the ritual of modern voting was foreseen as long ago as the 1850s. I've got a quote here from an observer from the state of Victoria 
writing just after secret balloting was first instituted in Australia. Quote, the secret ballot does away with all the base dissembling and hollow protestations of canvassing for votes, of kissing squalid children, of flattering slatternly housewives, of cajoling partial fathers, the whole demoralising influence of the flagon and the purse. Everything is now proceeding with the same tranquil placidity as if the community was undergoing a trying operation under the influence of chloroform, waking up to the consciousness on the declaration of the poll, the proudest of civil rights exercised with all the peace and security of a religious ceremony. I guess he was a Protestant. <laughs> now, modern politicians pandering to working families will chuckle at the vain hope that campaigning would ever be free of solicitation. Campaigning, as I said before, inevitably involves a ritualised inversion of the normal order of the ruler and the ruled, where every candidate from the Prime Minister down asks for our votes. But what was noticeable even in the 1850s was a utilitarian and efficiency desire to chloroform the hubbub of traditional elections. And this was to be done, amongst other things, through the technology, the legal technology of the secret ballot and orderly police polling stations. Admittedly, at the time, there was some pushback. The South Australian governor at the time, Governor Ferguson, wrote that he lamented the lassitude he saw in the quietness of the secret ballot. But ultimately, the rationalists and the technocrats had their way. OK, voting is done in private, but it's also potentially a communal experience. The secular ritual of polling day is itself now under threat by what we now call convenience voting. I trace that term back at least to 1948 in the United States. There was a reformer there who said he wanted voting to be done by all postal balloting. And his argument was he wanted laws to make possible the economy of carrying the one ounce ballot to the polls instead of carrying the 200 pound elector to the polls. So obesity was a problem even then. <laughs> Postal voting, as you may know, has had a renaissance, driven partly by cost-saving considerations. So all male elections have been trialled in local government in Australia, in the United Kingdom, and they are how people must vote in a couple of United States states. In my home state of Queensland, postal voting recently by law became a right legislated that on demand you're entitled to vote by post. Now as a technology, this is all a bit ironic given that the red post box is going the way of the dodo. Nonetheless, postal voting, once the preserve of the immobile or infirm, now accounts for well over 10% of turnout. Now even on integrity grounds, this is a bit curious. Postal voting was originally a tightly guarded legal privilege because you can't guarantee a secret postal vote. A husband might suborn a wife or a mother might suborn their children to make sure they vote the right way. But also as recent UK electoral rorting cases show in local government or postal elections, postal voting has obvious other integrity weaknesses. You can steal ballots from nursing homes, uh, you can interfere with the post and so on. Parties in Australia, in a small way, have even manipulated the law to make themselves conduits for postal voting. The sample envelope you might see there looks very official, looks like it comes from the AEC, but actually sports a party address, in this case, the Liberal Party in WA. Now, even more significant than postal voting, pre-polling or early voting is also on the rise. Now, in contrast to postal voting, pre-polling doesn't save money. Sure, in some parts of the United States, early voting is critical. I mean, they vote on Tuesdays, a working day. In less resourced communities in states that mandate photographic voter ID, minorities have had to push very hard for the right to queue at pre-polling stations. But in Australia, where elections are run much more uh, fairly and efficiently, pre-polling tends to attract mostly staunch middle-class electors, people who know about the ability to pre-poll. They know where to pre-poll. People who think, rationally, I always vote for party X or candidate X, let's get it out of the way. 
This is obviously a consideration of pure convenience more than in the American situation. In the last Victorian state election, I think over 30% voted early, whether in person or by post. And I think even in a recent by-election, almost a majority of people voted early. Electoral commissions encouraging this trend are gearing up for elections where almost half may vote early. All of this, of course, however good it is for participation or um, integrity or not, threatens the once every year or so experience and symbolism of polling communally and on the same day. In this brave new electoral world, we're also told that internet voting is inevitable. It's being rolled out and trialled in New South Wales, albeit at this stage just for visually impaired service people and so on. Yet, as we rush towards this brave new world, will we at least stop to consider the shift in the performative meaning of logging in at any time, any place, to vote on our smartphones? And how that experience will differ from visiting a communal polling station, usually a community hall or school hall, on election day. It's a change on par with, say, the way the ritual of brewing and sharing tea was replaced by the convenience of the tea bag. Or, to give a more blokey metaphor, the way that T20 cricket, in short bursts at night and downloadable, is threatening the more leisurely formats of the past. Now, there are obvious deliberative and participation angles to the shift from election day to election month. Not knowing who votes early, parties. Having a hard time wondering how to stage campaigns. But my concern here is just to tease out the ritual and rhythmical elements of this shift. A London Times columnist recently wrote, a quote, the act of voting in Britain has all the glamour of queuing for a wee at a school jumble sale. <laughs> this wasn't a whinge. She meant that the pedestrian nature of voting at a local school hall said, she said, had an authenticity, a symbolic value in which we the people, see we the people, gathering to put pencil marks on paper and to exercise the recall power over our political masters. It's quite a leap from the tangible communal paper ballot to the ephemerality of internet voting any time from any place. Finally, voting is a very public duty or responsibility. And I want to just talk here a bit about the rhythm of election night. Election nights are a time when elections and drinking are reunited. <laughs> if you're interested, my book has whole chapters on alcohol and another chapter on betting, which is, as you know, reappearing at election time. Now, political parties today are obviously wary of offering alcohol, because that's the old crime of treating, at political meetings these days. Indeed, Australian law since 1902 has forbid voting being held on the licensed part of premises, even though in some small towns, pubs are all that's left. Yet well-lubricated election night parties remain the climax of the ritual for many. As Ken Barons know better than anyone else, Australia once had a national tally room, pictured left. The tally room evolved out of the practice where newspapers used to set up giant tally boards, like old-fashioned cricket scoreboards, on election night. The national tally room was born out of a desire to have an official public focus for election results. Though it became an institution, along with Malcolm, <laughs> overseen by electoral commissions, open to all citizens, a tangible symbol of democracy. It was a scene of triumph and despair. People of a certain age, like me, still recall Prime Minister Bob Hawke being mobbed in 1983 as Malcolm Fraser wept as he lost office. But the national tally room has died at the hands of cost cutting, the advent of computerised feeds, but also a drift, a preference by media and politicians alike to be in more controlled environments. Just as parties in Australia shy away from public rallies these days, so they prefer now the secure interior of a hotel ballroom, whilst the media sucks in the electronic data and brands it with its own graphics. No more the gaze of the physical tally board, the symbol of the river of numbers encompassing our individual votes, forming a flood that can sweep away rulers. Now, I'm not being a Luddite. I've got an iPhone, got a laptop. The public space of elections was 
since at least the mid 20th century, if not earlier, a mediated one for most people. Electronic voting in time, surely, will transform the public rhythm of election night with its parties, its live crosses, its schadenfreude. Because with e-voting, the results could be known instantly, then dumped en masse into a supercomputer rather than the kind of unfolding with suspense. Now, relatedly, many countries ban opinion polls in the last week or two before polling day, but not the English-speaking world. Ostensibly, they do it for integrity reasons, but also to give a time of deliberative repose when people can think, undersiders can think about their ballot and there won't be uh, masses of opinion polls. But limiting opinion polls also invents, invests the event of election night with some greater suspense. Compare British election nights. The Brits, and in Northern Ireland, vote until 10 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. That's a full four hours later than our polls close. The British also have a curious ritual of counting. They count all the paper ballots on election night. Now they can do that. British people vote on a single ballot with a cross, none of this preferential voting. The count is much simpler. Also, by law, British postal votes, unlike ours, have to be in by the close of polling. In Australia, here's a little secret, you can vote after Saturday night by putting it in a post box on Sunday, and of course there's no postmark. But there's 10 days for which postal ballots can dribble in. Now, in Britain, all votes in by 10 p.m., physically able to be counted on the night, city councils, in response, race, race to be the first to declare each result. Talk about ritual over integrity. What would Clive Palmer have to say about that? By law, in the UK, the local mayor is the nominal returning officer, and the local mayor then declares the poll. These declarations happen in the wee hours, using we in a different uh, meaning here, in the wee hours of uh, Wednesday morning. Friday. Sorry, Friday, yes, <laughs> I've got on Thursday, I'm thinking of the States. In the wee hours of Friday morning, except in Northern Ireland, across 600 or so communal tally rooms, and the customary rule is that all candidates attend, if they can, and they're invited, like Edmund Burke of old, to give a final address to their electors. As in the image on the right, even a re-elected prime minister can be brought down to level. After the Iraq war, Tony Blair faced not only a monster raving loony party candidate, I think she's the one wearing the Belia hat, <laughs> on national TV, beamed live from Sedgefield, but also face an independent candidate at the microphone there, Mr. Keyes, whose son had been a serviceman killed in Iraq. Okay. I want to talk a little to, to finish up about electoral privatism and quietism. Two isms. In contemporary times, fear or resentment of electoral passivity and quietness is often not far from the surface especially amongst political progressives. So Professor Jill Lepore, writing in the New Yorker magazine, said that she longed for more electoral hue and cry, sometimes inside that tiny booth behind the red, white and blue curtains. It's just a little too quiet, she said. A fellow American, Professor Hirschbeam, similarly has written, and he's a Marxist, that he's worried that for many election day is bereft of its former liturgical fullness the carnival spirit is gone. I wonder what he would have thought about the LNP proposal in Queensland in 2014 to ban all electioneering on polling day, New Zealand style. A measure I opposed in the media as a final leaching of the colour and activity of the day, as much as it was, I think, an attempt to limit the freedom of non-political party activists to turn up and dress up as firemen or of opposition parties to gang up on the LNP and distribute how to vote cards to encourage preference swaps. In the end, the government thankfully did not go through with that proposal. At the heart of all this is a concern or issue about electoral quietism. It's the feeling that while we don't want the excessive money or the razzmatazz of US politics, 
that elections, not just in Australia, but in other developed countries today, are too placid or insufficiently passionate. Now, this regret can be seen as a friendly critique of electoral democracy. Elections are worthwhile, they're great, but they should be more engaging. It's a rallying cry for elections plus. A call for a more integrated, participatory and deliberative democracy throughout the electoral cycle. Now, from a legal institutional perspective, once one old established rule or practice is superseded by a new one, so maybe paper balloting by internet voting, the old practice quickly comes to be seen as archaic and senseless. And the new one, in time, starts to feel very natural. This is very true of politics, where streamlined forms of electoral administration and very top-down, professionalised and centralised campaigns now seem entirely natural or inevitable. In turn, older forms of electoral practice appear highly ritualised. We gape at the past, like a foreign country, like early anthropologists at the workings of some unfamiliar tribe. We gape at the Hogarth image, we gape at images and ideas from the previous century. Ultimately, it's unrealistic to expect the typical election and settled democracy to bear the same passion as when the ballot was younger. Ultimately, the lament about quietism and privatism is not for a lost oasis. It's more a lament about a perceived lack of political engagement and interest. But there's no magic wand to revivify politics. It's not something laws or electoral commissions can ordain. The law can just create the space, but it's up to parties and citizens to fill that space. Whilst the lament about electoral quietism carries a whiff of nostalgia, I've said before, it's far from new. When secret ballot laws were introduced, there were those who despaired that elections had assumed a new quietness and indifference, just as others welcomed the tranquil placidity of election day. So contemporary concerns about civic privatism, which is a, a borrowing from professors Ackerman and Fishkin in the US, turn out to be nothing new. But just as there was no sausage sizzle in the electoral days of rolling out the barrel, my ultimate points are that the electoral processes and rituals of today are certainly different from, but not always lesser than those of the past. But if we don't attend to describing and understanding the ritual dimension of public law and public practices, we can't begin to appreciate their importance, let alone openly undertake the evaluative task of deciding which elements we want to savour, which elements we want to update, and which ones we might want to farewell. So it's over to question time now, but if you want to read more, that's the title of my book. It comes from an academic press, so I'm afraid it's not cheap. If you email me, I can send you a discount code for half price, <laughs> online ordering. Um, sorry, Rosemary, I've sullied these halls with a bit of campaigning myself, oh. but... Um, you're, you're forgiven. Good. I'm glad you mentioned the sausage sizzles at the end, because there's also the cake stall. <laughs> there's also running the gauntlet of, of all the um, people handing out how to vote cards and the dreadful choice between do I politely just accept them all and collect them or do I say, no, thank you, I'm fine. Um, I thought you were going to say it's time for lunch and you're hungry. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm going to say it's time for questions. And uh, anyone who has a question or a comment, if you'd like to put your hand up, we will get a microphone to you. So put your hand up boldly, yes. Tim? I should want to, I think you record these and they go at the end of the, yes, yes, of the essay when it's published, yes. so. Hi, um, I'm glad you mentioned the sausages at the end too. I, what, did you know that there is actually a Twitter account and now somebody's developing an app yes. that will actually tell voters where the sausage sizzles are on polling yes. day so that they can queue up. And, and um, last election in 2013, there were reports, I, I believe from the account, um, in some polling stations of the queue being twice as long for the polling booth because people turned up just for the sausage sizzle. Well, I'm a former vegetarian, I think it's great. Um, yes, I mentioned snagvotes.com in the book, um, and there's, I think, similar kinds of, and these are all totally organic, uh, grassroots, community style um, things, and you don't actually see that overseas. Um, and uh, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. The whole idea of where we vote is, is, is interesting because um, people who say, yes, voting at schools has certain meanings. There are others who say, look, if you vote at school or church halls, you're going to influence the way people think. Wherever we do these things, embodied and embedded, we do them in a physical space. And if those physical spaces can be welcoming, then obviously it's better than, you know, in a country where you might turn up at a courthouse to vote. And, you know, if you've been in trouble with the law or you're young, that's not going to be so welcoming. Or if you had to turn up at an electoral commission office, um, colourful as they are, that would have a more bureaucratic feel than the sausage sits of the local school and the PNC and the Lades Auxiliary and the Scouts and, and all that. The last, election. the last election I voted at, my local school did their fate and they had a jumping castle at an election. I was like, this is the best thing ever. We should make this the law. <laughs> I won't ask how many times you pushed aside the kids to jump in the jumping castle. <laughs> but it, it's funny, there are some academics who've had funding in America to trial the idea of having uh, non-alcoholic fates and parties uh, on election day. And part of the problem they have is voting on a Tuesday. Schools are all taken, unless it's, a, it's an election in a, in a holiday, and it's set on November, so it's unlikely. We'll go to uh, Marcus Markle. Yes, first, and then we'll come down the front. Something you didn't mention, Graham, is the uh, good old-fashioned public meeting. And I do wonder whether such things can exist in Australia anymore, particularly in the light of the episode that occurred at the Queensland election last year where a gentleman went along wearing a T-shirt, standing next to people with the logo I'm with Stupid on it and was arrested by 10 of Queensland's finest. Now, it's unimaginable that in the Menzies era, uh, a person seeking to disrupt a public meeting by interjecting or otherwise uh, would have had the police called on them. And when I was talking to some of my electoral friends in East Timor and described the way in which campaigning has become so sanitised in Australia today, their response was, how hopeless are your politicians that they won't stand up in front of whoever wants to come along and answer whatever is said to them? Um, how have we got to this point of the sanitisation of this institution of the public meeting? I don't know. You know, that's interesting because I almost thought, if I didn't know, you might have been going to say, look, we can't have public meetings because there'll always be some person who wants to upstage it. And that may be a good thing. I don't know. Um, the, my next project, I want to look at the issue of the regulation of speech uh, horizontally. So the way that social media and employers and others are protecting their brands and image by trying to sort of crack down on what people say and do and how they express themselves, people over whom they have uh, some contractual power. Um, I'm reminded of a lovely photo, you probably know the guy uh, who used to run a New, New Guinea elections, Mr. Shit, uh, who was half advertising his business, which I think was to uh, suck out excrement from drains, but his, he would appear on the ballot paper and with his t-shirt says Mr. Shit. So there's some of that kind of, you know, colour that I, I think um, um, we don't necessarily want necessarily say um, people running to promote their fact that they're a prostitute, which happened in Queensland a few years back, or the people who run, I won't mention names, allegedly to get the 4% of the vote. Um, so to, not to commercialise it, but if people want to argue politics and want to, then it's, it, it's a shame if they're not doing that. Um, but I think the death of the public meeting and the rally was um, probably traced back to John Houston's days when... Um, he went around the country and there were lots of Labor Party operatives and activists, you know, trying to create the sense of disorderliness. But it's, it's very odd that in a country like Australia with its Irish and Indigenous roots and so on that we've got this sort of fear of, of, of disorder. Um, in terms of law, I mean, the public meeting was written long ago into early Australian law and, and British law, the idea that a candidate was entitled at law to free use of rooms in schools and school halls for those traditional gatherings and meetings and you know adults turning up having to sit in tiny chairs and pews <laughs> but to have a kind of deliberative discussion that's now almost gone even in the United Kingdom but we certainly have got such a top-down culture and such a control freakery culture um, I won't condemn the Queensland finest <laughs> you can but it, it is, I guess it's a worry and a concern Hello, thank you. Uh, I very much take your point about uh, the idea of not forgetting, in the, in the urge for convenience, not forgetting that it is something that is bigger than ourselves and that's what rituals do. 
Um, I had not equated drinking and elections before. That's that's new to me, but. Um, I, I, Therese from Sweden. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I was going to say that in Sweden, actually, elections are very, very quiet affairs. It's uh, always the same time of the year. It's a dark time of the year. It's 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 um, cold, and you go in and you quietly leave. So even the sausage sizzle isn't there. But I did want to mention a ritual that has gone the same way in Sweden as what you're describing, and that is paying taxes. So when I was younger, I lived uh, very close to the main uh, tax office and the date for paying was the same date for everybody and people would come on the date with the envelopes now these days you can pay with a text message you can um, sign your tax declaration but in those days you paid on the day and there was a, um, a, a marching band uh, people out with with the big sacks to gather uh, a huge street party for paying taxes really? but election day was actually very quiet so everything you're describing about elections I remember with with paying taxes now you do it with with on your on your phone the point I wanted to make was about color um, a few your, your book is very focused on I think in general quieter countries, but um, warmer countries, I'm thinking again climate and, uh, and ritual and color. So Sweden, very cold, very dark, not a lot of color and noise outside. But in countries where they have elections outdoors, mm -hmm. you really see what you're describing, this sense of something public, of something that engages people. So when elections are held under a tree, mm -hmm. and when counting is very public, mm -hmm. uh, you know, frilimo, un voto, and, and people yelling and screaming, you can see that in one of the neighboring countries here, Indonesia, where it's a, a public mm -hmm. count in, in the village square, and everybody's there to watch it. So I think, um, yeah, just, just an addition is this idea of warm weather and, uh, and outdoor. It, it, it adds to color and yeah. noise. Well, two things. One is you know, the change in public space that some political scientists and sociologists have tracked for, for centuries now. Um, you, you've, you've effectively touched on there. Um, the other thing, and, and, and our public space is becoming more internalized and individualized or trans transactionalized to use the jargon so obviously i was thinking the other day and it's mentioned in my book watching my children grow up and you know whilst they're highly ipadic <laughs> it's their generation and that you know, happens very young as you may know because they're so well designed they're so intuitive these devices and yet something as fundamental as money you mentioned taxes um, the tangibility of coins and even our polymer plastic notes is fundamental to them coming to understand the idea of, well, this, does it contain value? Is it value? Is it something I should worship? Much different from um, plastic credit cards. And now we're moving into the era of, as you say, you'll just text your uh, account details. It's just digits somewhere in some big computer. Uh, the meaning of money changes uh, particularly. Um, and yet, watching my kids, they, they, they need that. They need that kind of tangibility to at least at some point begin to understand an abstract concept like money and maybe certainly an abstract concept like democracy. I'm glad that Rosemary mentioned how to vote cards, which is surely one of the strangest aspects of Australian elections. And could I solicit a comment from you about how to vote cards, which are surely um, strange, in my view, one of the silliest parts of elections. In the age of convenience pre-poll uh, postal voting, are we all headed the way of the ACT, where in practice how to vote cards are banned and election days are dreary and colourless? Yeah, so I, I don't know, I I'm, must have been a bit of a nerd, but I used to actually collect how to vote cards. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I thought them as a strange thing. It was like collecting football cards. And the, the, the reds versus the blues and the greens. And I remember saying uh, to my mother, because I, I like blue and white. That was my football team. Uh, not Canterbury Bankstown, but Brisbane Brothers. Uh, saying to my mother when I was very young, I'm going to follow these liberals, the blues. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, I went back to her and I said, no, I, I heard that these liberals and these uh, people, country party back then, they're ganging up on the reds. That's unfair. <laughs> oh, the Reds. Um, more seriously, how to vote cards, yes, you wouldn't in, 
you wouldn't invent them in any other system. They're an artefact of the preferential voting system, which long ago the parties are wedded to. And we're not going to get rid of them because it suits the major parties, because they're the only ones who can get enough activists to uh, man the polling stations. But they're having increasing problems with three week long early voting, uh, getting that kind of, uh, they'll almost have to do it, maybe a Clive Palmer and pay people to, to, to hand out how to vote cards. Um, I think they're a hard waste of paper and so on, but they're still part of the, the whole process, as Rosemary said, of uh, do you accept them all to show your, to not reveal your, your ballot? Do you get in a huff and only take the ones of the party you like? Um, do you take them home to write shopping lists on? It's a, it's a big issue. <laughs> Graham, you had a lucky childhood because when I was a child, we had to stay in the car. You know, <laughs> polling places were not places for children, according to my parents at least. Really? And, and we missed out on, on the ritual of the polling booth. It was a very serious place where mummy and daddy went to do something oh. very important. Well, A, it would be illegal in Queensland and B, uh, you'd probably die if it was a summer election. <laughs> yes, well, I grew up in Sydney, we didn't die. Uh, really. Any further questions? Yes, here. Lee, where are you? Oh, oh up the back. Sorry. Yeah. We'll go to you first and then come back down here. Yeah, just a quick one. I was wondering what impact you saw compulsory voting has on the ritual of Election Day, because there aren't that many countries that compel people to be there. And you get pictures in newspapers all across the world of that shot of, you know, four people lined up at the polling booth, one with a surfboard you know, in, in thongs and all this kind of stuff. And because everyone has to be there, which presumably makes it a different ritual from mm. someone making an active choice to go out of their way to go to their local school to be there and vote. Yeah, compulsory voting is interesting. I have to give a talk in April at a, a big law reform conference that my colleague Ron is running at ANU. Um, compulsory voting, I think, is an interesting thing in Australia because um, I don't think it necessarily changes politics dramatically. In the long term, it may it may uh, mean that uh, our policies are a little bit more egalitarian, I'm not sure. But um, it, it encourages out, I think, a lot of people who would not otherwise vote, um, who are suburbanites, not the guy with the surfboard, the people who are suburbanites with kids who are too busy for politics. They appear to be late swinging voters. It really is just people who are turning up and saying, I'll, I'll stick with the devil I know. So it can have actually a, a status quo effect at state and national elections. That's my theory, at least. Uh, in terms of the ritual, yes, I think it adds, it can add to the, uh, the order and quietitude of the ritual. It certainly makes the electoral commissions very keen to maximise uh, turnout for, for good reasons. Um, but you're going to have more convenience voting, one argument is, because you're compelled to vote. So you've got to make it as easy, easy as possible. On the other hand, it's done away with some of the hand-to-hand um, -hand or face-to-face -face nature of politics. So the whole get out of the vote uh, that you might have known from if you're from UK, uh, or the use of cars and conveyances, you know, getting your activists in, in jalopies to go around and you know, pick up people, particularly elderly people, to make sure they get out. Um, once upon a time, that was made illegal by law, at least paying someone uh, their bus ticket. That was made illegal in the 1880s. Um, but now it's an integral part, I guess, of the, of the um, uh, communality of Election Day uh, in other countries, less so in Australia. Fourth row. No. Row before, and then we'll go to you. Sorry. <laughs> he was first. Um, just a, a quick comment and then a question. Um, for those who are relatively newer to voting, um, one of the reasons we have had a vote cards in Australia is, as Graham mentioned, the preferential voting system, but also prior to 1984, party names weren't written on ballot papers. Um, so if you wanted to know to vote for a particular party's candidate, you needed there how to vote. Um, but just... Um, on a question, um, do you have, uh, would you like to comment, or I invite you to comment on the sort of shrinking unregulated space around elections, um, given that, um, for example, following the Western Australian Senate um, issue that the AEC's regulations around polling places will tighten up and handling of ballot papers, but also, um, you know, in some states, how to vote cards are now required to be on a certain template. Um, the, the, I guess the increasing um, professionalisation of election management and the management around elections is, is arguably shrinking the space in which sort of ritual can thrive in Australia, or it seems to me anyway. Do you have any comments about that? Look, certainly um, as a, a law person, we love laws and <laughs> our biases towards uh, what we call 
juridification. So you take things that happen naturally in society and then you start adding these layers of, of regulation. Um, always, you know, for good reasons or apparently good reasons, but you just add more and more and, and then it can become a kind of stifling edifice. Um, the, there's obviously a risk of that, yeah. And uh, as you say, it can be part of the professionalisation, it can be part of what I call the druidification. It can also just make things more difficult for newer entrants and players, so in terms of participation, um, because they're less likely to have uh, good legal advice or they're more likely to get caught up in the net um, or even, you know, local constituencies and branches, you know, are less able to deal with some of the laws that otherwise are very uh, favourable towards, such as, um, you know, proper accounting of political money, can often catch up newer players or uh, outsiders, uh, some of whom are the ones who are bringing both the new blood and the colour to an election campaign. So it's obviously a, something we need to be thinking about. Um, Thank you for a most interesting talk, Professor. Uh, you, during your talk, you noticed you, you noted the demise of the tally room, national tally room. Uh, now, that got me thinking about it, its place in the concept of a ritual, and I thought, well, maybe it's. I mean, it was a big part of the rhythm and the ritual for, for decades. But I was thinking that maybe it's a bit more than just ritual, because. On election night, it's part of the nation's expectation that they know what the outcome is going to be or what it will probably be. And the tally room, of course, is televised and the commentators are in the tally room as well. And it did occur to me that those things happening within a tally room run by the Electoral Commission gives the whole process of um, reporting what's going on uh, an authenticity that it might lose if it's just left, you know, to be done from television studios. I wonder if you have any thought about that. Yeah, look, I, there's a certain gravitas that can come with it. I mean, the place was always buzzing and it must have been a, an enormous logistical uh, nightmare to run. Um, and what we've moved net to now is obviously, you know, the uh, Anthony, is he here? <laughs> Anthony Green, you know, the people getting feeds into the different uh, Channel 2, Channel 9 and so on. Um, and when we move to internet voting, and when that happens, there will be the potential, you know, for all the results to be known almost instantaneously, apart from those that rely on late postal votes. Um, and there might come a time where there will be a lot of, I, th I guess, people who will be saying, how can we trust this? You know, you know, I went to vote and I pressed something on a screen and then entered a black box and then it comes out with this set of numbers that are being delivered to us uh, by five different networks. I, I, can, I can see your point, uh, exactly. I don't think we've lost completely lost rituals though. I mean, some of the things where we, the ability of the modern media to um, cross to people's backyards, you know, and to get that kind of beamed into the backyards of uh, the winning or losing candidate with the booze going and their kids in the background and people crying or not crying and laughing, and then they're being put on the spot and they may not be, um, well versed in dealing with the media, especially live crosses on national TV. So that's uh, one thing that we, we've gained in the swings and roundabouts of, of, of the change from a more uh, singular physical focal point, the national tally room, to this more dispersed coverage. Are we, oh, one more. I think we've got time for one more. Tim down the front, third row. Sorry, Graham, and thank you again for your presentation. And particularly, I love a good diagram. And uh, the diagram took me to thinking that you would be uh, following the thread of how ritual can offset uh, cynicism. Um, your, your bottom left quadrant can offset your bottom right quadrant, and that's very much an issue. And I'll, while you think about how you might stretch that thread out, I feel like a lot of people in Australia will be very cynical about politics. And you know, politicians are all the same, and it doesn't matter what we do, yet they still love a good election day, they'll still mm. go down and buy a sausage and they'll still do that. So how do those two things offset? And as we go forward with the future of ritual, can it still combat that, that cynicism? Yeah, look, I mean, I think Australians are by nature, at least allegedly, uh, you know, strong bullshit detectors, as we say. Um, so I don't think ritual's ever going to be fall into the kind of 
we're nowhere near the kind of fascist state that you know, occasionally some very smaller liberal academics have said to me, look, it's, ritual is a good way of describing what goes on, but if you're going to be trying to design rituals top down that sort of tell people, you know, you'll be marched off to school like scouts to worship Anzac Day, they see that as a, as a worry. We're a long way f from that situation. Um, what I see instead is in Queensland, uh, we may have a, uh, almost a snap referendum coming up in the next month or two to do away with three year cycles and go to a four year rhythm. Now, the major parties have both backed that. The bill's gone through parliament. The business community, or at least the council of chamber and commerce, the large businesses, they're all behind it. Um, so far, the Council of Civil Liberties, a few academics like me are saying, hang on a minute, you know, even if you think that we need fewer elections because and the argument will go, oh, you know, people don't really enjoy voting and uh, we, we need more time as public servants, I understand that, to develop policy. Um, and maybe a bit another year, job security for politicians will somehow make them more in touch with people. I don't know. <laughs> Queensland does not have an upper house does not have Bill of Rights, does not have proportional representation. It's only got one major newspaper. We're the last state that needs to be voting less often um, in those circumstances. So there's my plug on a, on a different issue. But I think you're right. People, um, at least opinion polls say most Australians would still turn out even with compulsory voting. They, they believe that they would still want to vote. They're habituated to vote and we only need compulsory voting because there's other people who, who have to be prodded along. Um, and I think we do have relatively high levels of trust in our, uh, uh, our institutions, on international standards, certainly. Um, and those, the communal aspects of voting, uh, a lot of people seem to value, but there are others, obviously, who don't. And if we get a generation who get used to voting on, you know, on a computer, um, we, might, we might lose that. Well, I think that's probably a fine point to end. I'd like to thank you very much, Graham, for a terrific lecture and thank everybody here for their contributions and lively discussion. Thank you.